So hello and uh, good afternoon. Uh, what I'm presenting to you today is an analysis of how women in the Middle East, specifically um, in Egypt and Tunisia, use Instagram or have used Instagram almost a decade since uh, the Arab uprisings of late 2010, 2011, as well as the micropolitical potential of Instagram in this context. So what is uh, well known in both the scholarly and non-academic circles is the significant role of social networking sites or SNS in engaging citizens during and following the Arab uprisings. What I try to do in, in my study is ask the question, what changes and developments have manifested in Arab societies in the context of citizens' use of social networking sites almost a decade after the Arab uprisings? And how young women in the Arab world use Instagram? And I focus specifically on the phenomenon of self-presentation, being a, a communication scholar, self-presentation and identity dynamics is, is, is a significant area of study for me. So I focus on self-presentation and what might be the political potential of these self-presentations and identity dynamics. Now, um, as most of us might know that self-presentation is a significant aspect of Instagram use, specifically because it's, a, it's, it's mainly a visual medium. However, while Instagram posts may not always be political in the sense that they may not directly relate to the government or public affairs of a country, their existence in the online, you know, often global public sphere can make the personal and private a public message, thus transforming the personal and private action and self-presentation <laughs> to a form of political participation. So how do I define micropolitics or political potential for this study? I take from Asif Bayat's conceptualization of micropolitics as the collective sentiments, shared feelings, and public opinions of ordinary people in their day-to-day -day utterances and practices that are expressed broadly in public spaces, in taxis, buses, shops, street sidewalks or in mass street demonstrations. Now, if we look at it in the context of new media spaces, these micropolitics or everyday politics like Instagram self-presentation have the potential to reclaim women's agency. And as Chandra Mohanty argues, everyday feminist struggles and micropolitical practices are as important as organized politics, as they have the potential for radical sociopolitical change. So in this study, I analyzed the accounts of 10 young women Instagrammers, five from Egypt and five from Tunisia uh, in 2017, which was like I mentioned earlier, almost a decade after the Arab uprisings. And I chose Egypt and Tunisia because Egypt is seen as one of the Arab Spring's many failures and Tunisia as one of its partial success stories, at least until 2017, which is the time frame of my analysis. But my goal was neither to engage with the intended recipients nor how audiences are reacting to the Instagram posts because my study is a textual rhetorical analysis. Rather, my goal was to assess the role of Instagram in creating new platforms, identities, and political realities for young women. So to maintain anonymity, I'm not gonna share the details of these Instagrammers, but what you see here are uh, quick snapshots of each of these accounts and their most unique qualities. So, and all the E's are the Egyptian accounts and the T's are Tunisian accounts. So for instance, E1, uh, for E1, most of her posts are selfies and there is an emphasis on global fashion. For E4, uh, there was significant use of Arabic, French, and English in her posts. E5 uh, had a diverse variety of posts, unlike the other Instagrammers, and her account also had a global quality. T8, for instance, liked wearing traditional clothes and promoted Tunisia through cultural hashtags and images. T10, for instance, used Instagram lingo, global Instagram lingo, such as hashtag OOTD, like 
out, outfit of the day and so on extensively. And there was an emphasis on fashion and makeup. Also, um, I want to be respectful of time, so I can't get into them, not getting into the details of the analysis, but I wanted to mention that more than 50 codes were identified. Uh, so I analyzed the first 50 posts from each of these 10 Instagrammers account and more than 50 codes were identified. The ones you see being the most prominent ones. For instance, location, occasion, mood, fashion, national identity, positive and negative language. And based on my analysis, I claim that, or I found that two main themes emerged from the data. Instagrammers online self-presentation portraying liberal individualist citizenship and rooted cosmopolitanism. And I'll spend uh, the rest of my presentation focusing mainly on uh, liberal individualism. So liberal individualism emphasizes an individual's economic rather than political nature and sees citizenship as a legal status and passive process. Uh, in this, citizens are almost always motivated by often capitalist self-interest than democratic participation uh, with the notion that the state has an obligation to protect citizens' rights instead of actively participating in the political domain as a political agent. So I claim that these Instagrammers seemingly are politically passive and motivated by their individualist self-interests and private activities with their political identity or politics with the big P identity marginal to their sense of self. However, these private acts manifest their micropolitics. So to give you an example, and I focus on their use of selfies, most of these Instagrammers uh, in their selfies presented solely their own selves, that is only themselves in the selfies. There were no other individuals. For instance, E1 had 32 selfies, but only one of those was with her brother. E4 had 54 selfies, most without other people, and several taken in mirrors with her iPhone on display. T6 had 72 selfies, frequently traditional Tunisian attire. T8 had 105 selfies, and interestingly, she commented regularly on the importance of friends and used hashtags such as hashtag BFF, hashtag my bestie, but rarely would her friends feature in those selfies. So I argue that this nonverbal visual character of these selfies provides that micropolitical dynamic. The nonverbal influence takes place through the Instagrammer's private act of posting selfies, the presence of their individual selves on Instagram, which is a public platform, emphasizes the nonverbal performance of visibility. So to elaborate on this micropolitical dynamic through nonverbal selfies, is that the absence of other bodies challenges the expectation of collectivistic behavior, the perception that Middle Eastern women ought to be rescued and are controlled by a male patriarch or authoritarian states. Uh, furthermore, when these selfies are accompanied with captions such as turn your back on him, a thought, educate yourself, don't let people and the powerful brainwash you with their opinions. So sick with patriarchy, but whatever. This act of posting selfies of only themselves challenges dominant norms. Also, by rarely featuring their friends, the Instagrammers make their individuality and their body central and visible while making their friendships and group identity backstage affairs. And finally, by presenting themselves in ways of their liking with iPhones or a Mac lipstick or the Quran, wearing shorts, swimwear, or the hijab, they portray agency. They do identity work through self-presentations and overtly enact their choice and portray an individuality without asking for consent. Now, some might argue and challenge that this kind of conformity to capitalism uh, could be seen as another form of subjugation. Here, I would say, let's not look at it from such a simplistic lens. Let's not be reductive. Because when it comes to capitalism, we must ask, what are the conditions of the present moment that encourage an exercise such as this? So I claim that the Arab Spring brought with it the hope for a democratic future. 
But the lack of experience with democracy, decades of existence under masculinist hegemony supported by authoritarian states, and the sustenance of the deep state, especially in Egypt, made Instagram a platform for female Instagrammers to conduct their everyday politics, not through active political participation or activist discourses and normative democratic means, but front stage presentation of individualism, a breaking away from their collectivist identity and portrayal of their economic and capitalist nature, but as a means of visibility, distinctiveness, distinctiveness and defiance. And we must not also forget the power of nonverbal communication. So the nonverbal aspect of the selfies and the Instagrammers focus on seemingly apolitical aspects such as fashion and appearance gave them the ability to challenge patriarchal norms and authoritarian power while being strategic and cautious about detection, pointing to a covert micropolitics, that is distinctiveness and defiance in a very strategic but non-committal apparently non-threatening way to patriarchy and authoritarian power. So as Manuel Castells emphasizes, mass self-communication provides new platforms for citizens to in invent new programs for their lives with the materials of their suffering, fears, dream, and hopes. So I claim that for Egyptian and Tunisian Instagrammers, liberal individualist citizens, their overt and covert self-presentation through Instagram becomes a new techno-social practice embedded not only in new forms of agency, but also new forms of political participation. Um, here you see the second theme, which is rooted cosmopolitanism, and I'll give you a brief overview. Now, rooted cosmopolitans are individuals who are attached to a home of their own with, their, with its own cultural particularities, but taking pleasure from the presence of other different places that are home to other different people. And they can tread seamlessly between their national identity and global identity, a mindset that functions as a human capital as well as a global intercultural capability. So the two photos that you see on this slide are not examples from the accounts, but these are really good depictions of how most of these Instagrammers were presenting themselves. And this is where I claim and I argue is the micropolitics. So these kinds of portrayals challenge the reductive imperial oriental stereotypes of the supranational pan-Arab identity where a papori of Middle Eastern cultures, languages, and identi identities are reduced to a monolithic universe of Arabs, that is Arab women, must look a certain way. And it also challenges the perception of the Middle Eastern woman only as tradition bound, backward looking and or exotic. So I will end with uh, a comparative commentary and then finally conclude. So when I was comparing these two cases, I saw that during the time, time frame of my analysis and even later, uh, you know, looking at the sociopolitical situation in these countries, Tunisia has been heralded as the sole, though partial success story of the Arab uprisings until, 20, um, you know, until a few years ago. Uh, so this is reflected in these Instagrammers posts. So Tunisian women had posted more selfies, uh, used more Instagram lingo, and shared about their relationships and feelings in a much more open way compared to their Egyptian counterparts. They were also using hashtag Tunisian girl way more than Egyptian women were using hashtag Egyptian girl. And as we all know, by early 2020, uh, you know, well, as we all know, the situation in Egypt has been uh, downhill for, for a, a long time now. So in early 2020, which was the last time it went, and I looked at some of these accounts, and intriguingly, I noticed that most of the Egyptian accounts were no longer in existence, whereas most of the Tunisian Instagrammers who I analyzed were still active. So the larger sociopolitical scene allowed the Tunisian Instagrammers to continue their micropolitics rather consistently and in a more pronounced way, unlike their Egyptian counterparts. Um, and for the Egyptian Instagrammers, this was also an insinuation of despair and mistrust in Egypt's sociopolitical trajectory, Egypt turning into a military regime in 2013, after a brief tryst with democracy. 
and the affordances provided by Instagram may not have been unreservedly promising for Egypt's female Instagrammers. So in conclusion, as Pollock and Robbins in 2020 shared, that since the Arab uprisings, there has been a steep decline in the public's perception of the government due to increased perception of corruption and dissatisfaction with the government's uh, repressive measures across the board. Uh, with progressive erosion of citizens' rights and freedoms in general, youth participation in politics is less active and more informal. Um, these dynamic authoritarian and military regimes and transitioning democracies in MENA, uh, that is Middle East and North Africa, the government and deep state actors, you know, are continually looking for measures to also control and counter the micropolitical impact of social networking sites used by citizens. So with, with this reality and with this background and based on the findings of the study, I conclude that there is cause for optim optimism as regards the micropolitical potential of Instagram for young women in Middle Eastern societies for sure, but this cannot be viewed from a deterministic lens. That is, we still have to remember that Instagram uh, or social networking sites are still tools. They of course have their affordances, but they are still tools and really depend on how they are being used. But more importantly, and, and in context such as this, um, it is important to remember within which socio-political, socio-cultural, and even geopolitical context are these tools being used and for what purpose. So it is realistic for Middle Eastern women to continue exploring creative ways to use social networking sites for their everyday micropolitics, rather than approaching platforms such as Instagram as inherently democratizing technologies. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, now we're going to listen to Zahra Arad from the University of Connecticut. Uh, hello, uh, dear colleagues and friends. Uh, hello, greetings from Montreal, uh, where I am visiting. And actually, I just arrived uh, about a couple of hours ago, and um, I'm working from the lobby. So if my connection gets unstable, uh, Anna, would you please uh, point out so I won't speak in vacuum? Of course. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, now, uh, first, I would like to thank the Policy Studies Organization for organizing this really wonderful conference and Daniel Guterres for inviting me uh, and accommodating my travel schedule. Uh, unfortunately, I missed the earlier parts of the conference, but I'm really delighted to join uh, at least in this uh, last session. Uh, well, uh, I don't have a research paper. My uh, intervention today is more like a commentary. Uh, uh, and uh, the title of my talk is Between Religion and a Hard Place. Uh, and secondary titles, Women's Rights in the uh, MENA region, Middle East and North Africa. Well, some of you might have followed uh, 10 days ago, the UN Secretary General, uh, Antonio Guterres, uh, had an opening uh, speech um, at the annual meeting of the UN Commission on the Status of Women. And he presented a really grim picture. Uh, he highlighted several areas where there are significant gender gaps, and he also pointed to the erosion in progress made over the last few years. And I'm going to highlight two sentences from what he said, that the gender equality is growing more distant. On the current track, UN Women puts it 300 years away. Now, the 300 uh, hundred years, three centuries, is the global average. If you focus on the MENA region, we may need to wait for two more centuries, I'm afraid. Because to whichever social and political indicator on the status of women and gender equality we look, countries in the MENA region tend to appear at the bottom. 
Now, here's the uh, lack of economic source resources may serve as a partial explanation for some countries that rank low on these indicators. Uh, but many MENA countries do not have such an excuse. A few are high income countries and most of, of them are uh, in the middle income uh, range. Now, since uh, MENA countries are also Muslim majority countries, the main culprit appears to be the religion. And I would like to, then in my conversation today, I would like to uh, address the role of religion along with some interrelated factors, mainly authoritarianism and militarism in the oppression of women. In discussing these three factors, religion, authoritarianism, and militarism, I will also draw attention national actors, particularly the United States and its policies in need. Now, first, let me start with the religion. Excuse me. Now, all institutionalized religions, especially world religions, have been patriarchal. The prevalence of patriarchal norms and practices, however, vary. When we examine the history and original sacred texts of the Abrahamic religions, that is Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, Islam is often forgotten there, we may find Islam actually as faring better in terms of the treatment of women. Uh, I have some research on uh, women's rights and human rights, uh, especially economic and social rights in the Quran. And my reading of the Quran reveals several rights of women, including the right to life, the right to consent to marriage, right to divorce, and the rights to own and inherit property, to keep the property in her own name upon marriage. And women are also recognized as individuals with equal and direct obligations toward God. And they're also recognized as legal uh, persons. Uh, of course, we know that some of these rights such as inheritance and divorce are not equal to men's. But in the seventh century, what Muslim women could enjoy could not be even imagined by their counterparts who follow the other two Abrahamic religions or some other religions living in other parts of the world. So the question becomes what happened? Uh, why women who, Muslim women who have said, lost so much and I would like to hide my throat is oh, you, you dry. froze for a little bit there okay better now can uh, you I hear think me so. now yeah I can hear you yes okay thank you Anna now, I would like to highlight three developments to explain this uh, deterioration in uh, women's rights. One, the first one is that conservative, and here I will dare say misogynic, uh, misogynistic interpretations of Islam took over and spread around. Second, while reformed Christianity and Judaism became a commonplace in many countries, Muslim theologians and political leaders stick to the conservative school of thought. They also discredit and repress others who came up with alternative interpretations. And third, while secularization of the state, the public and the secularization of the public space, public uh, discourse, became increasingly the norm in different parts of the world, the trend in Muslim majority states has been Islamization. 
except a few episodes in some countries. Secularism is not a guarantor of the of gender equality, but creates room for alternative interpretations and allows women to raise their voice. It is not an accident that we see more and stronger women's movements in secular societies. Now, the second factor I would like to address is authoritarianism. We see the men and countries as subject to, uh, subjected to authoritarian rule of various kinds and degrees. In a few places where democratic institutions were established and liberal democratic rule were, uh, was approximated, they have not been stable. Like secularism, liberal democracy does not guarantee gender equality. But various freedoms, such as the freedom of speech, press, association, organization, and the right to participate in politics engender some opportunities for women to articulate and demand their rights. Here, however, I want to, regarding democracy and authoritarianism, I want to point out some anomalies here that they are. Uh, uh, some authoritarian states, including the ones in the MENA, created some opportunities and recognized some rights for women. Among them, we can include the 1920s and 30s of Turkey, Iran, and Afghanistan, and as well as uh, in the more recent decades, Morocco, Tunisia, and Jordan. However, I would like to stress that these regimes created opportunities for women, not necessarily due to their commitment to gender equality, but because they considered pursuing such policies, pro-women policies, as useful in meeting some other ends, such as economic development, healthier population and workforce, building a new image for the country, or at times to improve the regime's legitimacy in the eyes of their own people and as well as overseas. Now, I also want to point out that these reforms have been more stable or relatively more stable only if they had some women's organizations uh, behind them. Now, the third factor I would like to address is militarism. Now, since combatants are typically male, the impact of military conflict and militarism on women is often overlooked. However, military and armed conflicts of all sorts affect the lives of women and gender cultures significantly. They increase women's hardship in many ways, especially in economic and psychological terms. And they uh, make women subject to sexual assault, which is sometimes carried out as a deliberate strategy toward the women of the enemy. So I have to say that male sense of entitlement does not spare women from assaults from their own community. Moreover, these increases in uh, sexual assault and other kind of uh, attacks on women uh, increased the urge to protect women through the implementation of seclusion, uh, uh, seclusion and limiting their freedom of movement and other freedoms. Now, another element here we have to acknowledge is militarism hurt women also by channeling the country's limited resources that are badly needed for development and social services to armament and military mobilization. And women end up compensating for the diminishing public services if there, are, uh, there were any before the conflict. Finally, and this is very important, militarism reinforces aggressive masculinities and related patriarchal norms.
No, without denying the effect, effect that main parties responsible of the three oppressive mechanisms, conservative Islam, authoritarianism, and militarism are the male political, economic, and cultural elite in these countries. I would, uh, however, uh, now like to turn to attention to the role of the international actors, mainly the United States. Now, while the Western colonial powers, especially the United Kingdom and France, cultivated the seeds of the problems I just mentioned um, in many ways prior to the Second World War, they relied on the US as the leader of the Western bloc during the Cold War. We all know that the US's interest in the region has been both economic, mainly excess to oil, and uh, geopolitical. The US foreign policy of the containment of communism during the Cold War led, led it to follow a few specific policies which are important for our topic today. First, accepting and facilitating authoritarian rules as long as they remain a US ally. Second, helping the authoritarian governments repress their progressive left-wing opposition. Since demands for redistributive reforms in social policies treated as advancing communism. Third, unconditionally supporting Israel. We should think about this not only in terms of its impact on Palestinian women, but also in terms of its contribution to militarism and Islamism in the region. Uh, fourth, treating religion as a counterforce against communism and helping the Islamization of the culture and rise of political Islam. I will suffice to provide just a few examples. First, the encouragement of the use of Saudi petrodollars and embassies for the spread of Salafi Islam, the most conservative uh, and I will say misogynistic understanding of the religion, um, especially after the 1979 Iranian revolution, when Iran was lost as a ally, they turned to these more cities. Second, in Afghanistan, which included mainly conservative warlords and the gender ideology and policies of the Taliban. But we have to remember that, did I lose? Okay, just, I'll just for a second. Now, I think you're back. Yeah, is it better? Yeah. Now oh, no, we you... know the gender ideology of Taliban. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. We know about the gender ideology of Taliban, but uh, actually, if you look at the alternatives the, uh, that fought against the Taliban later on, the, uh, we are not going to see uh, any group uh, that is much more friendly uh, uh, to women because they all tend to subscribe to really conservative understanding of Islam. And Another factor here is that the, uh, which I would like you to invite to think about the impact of 40 plus years of warfare and militarism on Afghani women. The third example I would like to highlight is Iraq. And here US, United States first supported Saddam Hussein to gain the control of the Ba'ath Party. Ba'ath Party used to have uh, left-leaning, uh, pro-Soviet leanings. Then uh, U.S. supported 
Saddam Hussein's authoritarian rule, both as an anti-communist and anti-Iranian ally. And then the, uh, when the US turned against Saddam Hussein, it supported uh, Hussein regime's Shiite opposition and who have not been any friends of women, we have to stress. And finally, they toppled Saddam Hussein's governors and pushed Iran into a state of chaos and warfare. Now, since the end of the Cold War, Cold War anti-terrorism or war on terror in George W. Bush's words, replaced the containment of communism as the overarching foreign policy of the US. War on terror targets the extremist Islamist armed groups, but that does not change the essence of the US policy. The US continues to support authoritarianism, militarism, conservative, moderate Islam, and here I want to stress that moderate here stands for not armed against the US, not necessarily in terms of uh, its gender ideology. Now, given these conditions and the gendered impact of a fourth factor, neoliberalism, which I skipped due to the time constraints, I'm sure you would agree with me that the resilience and continuous struggle of women in the region appear even more remarkable. So I dedicate this talk to the MENA woman, especially to those in Afghanistan, Iran, and Turkey, who seem to be the most consistent and persistent opposition of their repressive governments these days. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we're going to listen to Ahlama Akram from Basira uh, for Universal Women's Rights. Uh, you have uh, around 20 minutes. Uh, well, first of Thank all, you. I must apologize. I got confused with the time. And I missed Zahra's mo seems to be valuable. And I, I really wish I listened. But in any case, uh, I, will, I will follow with the uh, with, with her later on, perhaps she can send me her presentation. Thank you all for coming and thank you for listening to me. Uh, uh, well, I'm gonna start by saying that my participation will be actually based on my own life experiences growing in Palestine, educated in Egypt, in Egyptian university, living in Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, and settling in London where I, I have seen, I, I, I experienced the Middle Eastern uh, um, life and the Western way of life uh, and values uh, and traveling most of the globe looking for researching the relation between religion and culture and women's rights. So this is it. I would start by in a Zoom meeting uh, organized by the Next Century Foundation uh, before the coming of the Taliban government. My comment was uh, reforming of family status law is the, is the test for any existing or coming government in, in Afghanistan. My, presenta uh, my presentation today will prove that justice and equality to women in the MENA region is the key to democracy, to global security and development. Um, well, I, I should start by saying that I was about, I was about 10 years old uh, when the Minister of Education uh, randomly came to visit my school. And I, I don't know what prompted me to ask to ask him that, why don't you teach us our religion when we are mature enough to understand and discuss and choose and learn to choose what's best for us. Uh, the most unfortunate thing, of course, I was a kid, I didn't realize that as a 
generally you should not ask anything about the religion, let alone being a female, you shouldn't know or understand. As I think you, if you come from the same background, you will understand exactly what I'm talking about. Um, the, 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 his diplomatic answer was that, um, that uh, we will think about it. And of course, it has been ever since forgotten. In fact, it, it got worse by the rise of political Islam. And I can see Zahra's smiling face agreeing, I think, I hope, you know, radical Islam have brought the worst aspects of the religion, whether to, to, to the Muslim world, let alone for women, you know. So um, the, for me at the moment is that reform of family status law is the only way to humanize the societies and to, to prepare the grounds for a, a culture, for a culture of peace that could contain conflicts because as women, we are more able to compromise and, and sacrifice to protect our loved ones. Empower, empowerment of women really with protection to their dignity is the only way for, to ground a peace culture uh, that will respect and accept and coexist with all local and global aspects of coexistence to avoid conflicts. Empowerment, empowering women with free thought education away from barriers of strict religious thoughts will protect society and will protect the, the global security, the global, um, yeah, the, the global security. Both reforms should and must be based on our common, common uh, humanity and must and should be superior to any of our religious limitations that have been instilled in our uh, subconscious based on twisted male interpretations to benefit patriarchy. And all, all reforms should be compatible with women convention of human rights. I will start by the education. The education in, the, in, the, in, in that area, I'm most unfortunate, um, is there are two levels, two standard of curriculums. One is religious, one is private, one is state, which create a which create eventually a separation in society itself between the same people within the same communities. Because of course, the private education will give the the, the person, the child, or the, the other the mature person a better quality education connected to the global world and how the changes in this world while, while the religious education in particular is connected to uh, very limited interpretations. <clears throat> and uh, it's, it's, it's an unstarter for changing society. Uh, I will take Egypt as an example, for instance. Um, uh, you have the power of uh, Al-Azhar, the most, uh, the highest religious institution in Egypt as well as in the Arab world. And Al-Azhar have been supposedly preparing imams from Pakistan as well as uh, educated over 700 uh, uh, Ma men, 700 men from Afghanistan. And we can see the situation today, what's happening in that part of the world. And as for me, it is a proof of the failure of Al-Azhar. Uh, beside Al-Azhar is definitely and closely connected with the Muslim brothers. Now, the problem we face today is most of what's happening in Egypt and the other world and in, in, in the Arab world is the absence of justice and equality, because all the interpretation, all the legislations are based on interpretations of Sharia uh, and what is intending from uh, to, to, the, to the women in particular from this Sharia, which is com completely contradictory to what God could have wanted to any, any human being. Uh, 
the problem we pay Egypt in particular face is that Al Azhar is the only establishment in 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 the Egyptian government in the Egyptian uh, state that it cannot be uh, interfered with. It 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 has a, it maintain its uh, independence, and uh, the the head of Al Azhar cannot be removed or put to retirement or or moved around because he is chosen by a group from Al-Azhar. So he is for a lot. And the problem Egypt is facing today is that Al-Azhar education, school education in the rural part of Egypt is, is, is connected to the worst interpretation of the religion. Uh, now, I don't want to dwell in the past. I want to look at solutions for the area as well as for um, locally and internationally. For me, the way forward for Europe is that Western, uh, Western world need to understand the, cul cul the religion and the culture that is connected so tightly to the, to, 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 to the religion. And it, you have to touch it very tenderly and very based on a, a kind of, an interpretation, a new interpretation connected to the tenets of God, forgiveness, mercy, a, a other, other positive to, to benefit the society. Now for Europe, we are, we are seeing the, the, the rise of Sharia councils, unfortunately, especially I'm taking um, the British, uh, by British experience, uh, where we have over 85 Sharia councils and they are spreading all over the UK. And the problem is, number one, Islam accepts that as a stranger in a country, you have to follow the law of the country. But most unfortunate is that the, the, the religious scholars have this grip over the community and they are expanding this Sharia councils, which absolutely away from any justice or equality for women. And women, most of them, the majority of them coming from rural areas of Islamic countries that they don't know what British or democratical values stand for, especially when it comes to justice and equality. And of course, they are subjected to society pressure if they don't follow the Sharia Council rulings. Uh, the, other, the other point is that which government, Western government should interfere is the spread of young girls hijab, which is absolutely not mentioned at all in, 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 uh, in anywhere in the religious uh, religion scripture or anywhere. Uh, young girls hijab for sure is discriminatory as well as a, a, it, it doesn't maintain the young girl interest or, or benefit of free education, of free thinking, of, of learning how to choose for ourselves. So this is my biggest dilemma. And actually young girls hijab completely contradict what the uh, Western countries uh, signed on CEDO Article 5, where it says that the governments should uh, protect the, 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 the right of belief, but at the same time, the, 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 the governments or the states must modify or abolish discriminatory cultural practices and take appropriate measures to eliminate sex role stereotyping and prejudice stemming. Um, I'm sorry, I have to read it because uh, I'm better. Anyway, um, yes, it, it, it's so sad to see, to see the rise of young girls hijab. And though I respect the choice of an adult woman hijab anywhere, not a, a niqab, but I do stand against young girls hijab because it's a preparation for a young woman subservient, obedient, uh, and it could, lead, it could easily lead, lead to underage uh, marriage. Now, as for the Arab world or the MENA region, I, I absolutely, um, 
wish and hope for number one, uh, as, as it's taking place in Egypt now, a reform of family status law, it's still they are trying to find the right interpretations and uh, which, which most fortunate that Saudi Arabia have got over that those interpretation and uh, removed so many limitations of to women to women uh, in Saudi, but at the same time uh, we need we to be substantiated completely and enhanced with a global education system and curriculum that is based on human va global values to protect women and protect the world security. Thank you so much. And I do welcome your questions because I am better in answering. Thank you so much. Anna? Hi, Alam. I'm, I'm one of the presenters, and Anna is the chair, so I'm wondering <laughs> what's going on. So maybe you and I can have a conversation because I don't... I would love that. Yeah, because I don't see um, any questions and nothing on chat. Um, and I wonder, uh, I, I think, uh, but, um, you know, on the, I think it's WOVA platform, I do see a few uh, comments, uh, Rebecca McNeil and Robert Whitley, I think, uh, there's some really uh, nice comments. Um, Robert says, uh, young girls should not be subject to hijab. The hijab was originally for Muhammad's wives and not, and I think no one else. I think that's what he meant. Um, so. can, I, can I say something here? Please, Please, yeah. Hijab in particular is still a debatable issue in the Middle East. Even Al-Azhar, he, 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 he keeps changing his mind. Sometimes where he says that it is obligatory, sometimes he say it's a choice. So, so women in, women get get confused between between the two. And the problem is the the rise of political Islam have used all kind of symbols of of demeaning women in in a way or another to 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 get a grip over the whole society. And and the problem is. I, can, I see the rise of political Islam, or let's say representative of Muslim brothers in particular in Europe, and they are uniting and they are having a strong grip over the Muslim community, which ends up in segregation, in women uh, rights, uh, forget it. I mean, you know, and, and, and it, it, it's totally against any religion, any religion. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, Zara, uh, it's, it's great to have you back. For some reason, uh, Anna is missing now. <laughs> so, so we are trying to figure out what we can I'm, do. So I, having a conversation. I, I'm Anna, here, I'm here, sorry. No oh, problem. she's back. <laughs> I, I lost, I, I was kicked out and tried to come in, try to follow a little bit from the phone, but kept trying and so I'm back. I don't know if there are any questions and sorry Alam that you missed my presentation and I missed yours. <laughs> well it's all right we can have a chat later on because as long as we have a vision a vision that is united for the for to, to protect women and to protect the world from the consequences of of uh, radicalization or close-mindedness. We are all human, for God's sake, enough. Thank you, thank you. We have some uh, questions from the online participants. Um, I mean, audience. <laughs> um, Ilan asks, um, are there any discourses in Al-Azhar uh, Al today that makes use of feminist theories? Uh, in general, how open is al Azhar to Western academic discourse in the humanities? Well, the and Robert, widely, I, should I 
ask both questions and so you can well, the other one is can we teach young girls via cell phones how to read and write i can take that last one but i think ahala or zara if you would want to go with the first two it's okay i don't know much about lsr so Neither i do don't I. want to speculate Alam, would you go ahead with the first year? Because I don't know much about Al Azhar. Well, look, Al Azhar is the it's the uh, the most important uh, uh, Muslim Islamic institution in Egypt, in particular, and it has a huge power, and a, a, a huge power, and it has been given to them by the to 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 it by the government to the extent that the government at the moment, but not at the moment for the past four or five years have been calling on Al-Azhar to, to renew the religious discourse or to reform it or anything. Like for instance, uh, verbal divorce for women and Al-Azhar refused to do that because this is, he insists that this is from Sharia. You see in a verbal, in a verbal uh, uh, divorce, the woman could get out with nothing and it, it doesn't protect her rights. And I'm talking here in particular about financial rights, such as the belated dowry, which loses its value with inflation, such as alimony. In fact, there are cases where the woman is forced to ask for, a, to initiate a divorce, to get, to get out of a bad marriage. But if she initiate that divorce, she will lose even the, the right of custody of her children. There are so many little things the West does not really know. And the most, the most unfortunate is that this institution, religious institution have the power over the majority in Egypt because of the, of the poverty. And it has, it, it, schools all over Egypt, and these schools, uh, their curriculum is 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 so is so backward to the extent it creates a a division between other, between Muslims and other minorities such as Christians or Baha'is. So we are we are moving in a dilemma of negativity. How to break it? We need to work together to break it. There are now educated, sorry, uh, Sumaya, if I'm going on, but I'm older than you and unfortunately my experience and I follow it. I follow what's happening in Egypt because Egypt is the heart of the Middle East. And, and the problem is at the moment we are facing another thing which is a positive change in Saudi Arabia, but still it's re rejected because the scholars, they want to maintain their position and they want to keep their bread and butter. Saudi have succeeded in removing them because he told them, you change your discourse. Then he came and he said, you have no power, stay in your houses and you will get your salaries. Saudi is a rich country. Egypt is not, it cannot afford to do that. And particularly that you are having about minimum of 70% who have been brainwashed and indoctrinated from a young age, you know, with these differences, you know, differences between us and the others and, and a young, a, a girl's position in, 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 in Islam and what you should do. So it's a long dilemma. And unless women, women all over the world reunite with one so one voice, one solidarity to say that women's rights should be connected to, to, glo to, 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 to the convention of women's rights, of human rights. You know, we are going to remain in this position. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sumaya. Um, I can take the last question. Um, so it's a very interesting question, when you, Robert, when you ask, can we teach young girls uh, via cell phones how to read and write? Um, as a media and communication scholar, um, of course, we have to view um, devices such as uh, cell phones and television or radio um, as tools uh, which have their um, benefits and affordances. So I, I won't say, no, you cannot, especially in the context of authoritarian states, 
yeah. um, or spaces where, again, we have been talking about the lack of freedom and so on and so forth. So whatever is available, uh, whatever means um, are available, whatever the tools available, let's use those to educate women, uh, to educate men and women, I would say. Yes, absolutely. Um, it's very important. So again, like I think that's important. Like both men and women need to be educated. Um, you know, again, the use of any device also allows for not just education in the local context. That's absolutely necessary. But but how can we also bring global perspectives um, into the culture? So I guess the answer to your question is, I won't say no. Absolutely, we can use tools, but cell phones as a, as a tool, uh, of course, doesn't, doesn't have the kind of um, bandwidth or uh, advantages like other tools might have. Uh, for instance, today we are sitting in different parts of the world um, and are able to have this conversation. A cell phone uh, may not enable that because again, remember, uh, what kind of cell phones are we talking about? You know, are these smartphones? We have to talk about Wi-Fi connectivity because a cell phone doesn't function just by itself. Uh, to be able to teach, to be able to learn, to be able to read, you have to have connection, you have to have access. Uh, so, so from a media perspective, when we think about connection, when we are thinking about infrastructure, and when we're thinking about authoritarian spaces or spaces where uh, both men and women may not have access to that kind of infrastructure, it, it, it is challenging. So uh, the answer is yes, um, if we can use it in ways that can help educate both men and women, that's great and we, can, we should use any tool available for that, but cell phones do have their challenges as well, like looking at the device itself. Well, I would... Sorry, go ahead, I, I'm done. I, I, I would... I... Sorry. No, I was, uh, yeah, go on, go on, Zahra, sorry. I, I would like to say that the, uh, first of all, that is like, the, how effective would that teaching be? That is one question that it, besides the technological problems in terms of pedagogy and so. And the second is the, I would like to say that it is a idea to resort to online, uh, uh teaching especially through cell phone uh because one of the things that we are dealing with in the MENA region is actually seclusion and isolation of women and function of education is not to learn a subject just to read and write or learn about history and geography and so on but we have schools for a particular purpose because these are also Basis of socialization, interaction, learning how to connect to other people, respect their opinion, uh, share ideas, uh, learn maybe again, this like depending on the kind of education. So learn about leadership. And uh, so you would be losing those. Second, I have to say, just like I give you an example from Turkey in um, the AKP, uh, Justice and Development Party government, which has been in power during this uh, for over 20 years now, uh, as it became more and more authoritarian and uh, religious, that is imposing its own understanding of religion on the public, actually, change reversed, actually, a lot of um, progressive human rights uh, legislation and uh, including women's rights. And one of the things they brought in was uh, a not making attendance school mandatory for middle school girls, middle school and high school. So after primary education, first four years, that is like, and so what are the consequences of that? Those not attending the school, what do they do? Where do they go? They're isolated and it also opened the door for uh, early child age oh, marriage. Yeah, marriage. And it has been increasing in Turkey where the civil law 
actually has the minimum age as uh, at uh, 17. And the uh, so um, there are really, this is like, I really don't even want to entertain the idea that if we cannot get the girls to school, we should provide them this other thing because this other thing is blocking the development of identity and uh, uh, basically this like the knowledge and confidence, whatever you say that like we would like to see young uh, girls to have will be blocked. Well, I'd like to point out something. I think we are at an era, especially now, uh, we definitely need to bridge the, the, the gap between the East and West. We, and as I repeat myself, women rights and reform in that part is the key. But as well as we need to, to uh, get the support of the diasporas, you know, like you and me, who are living here and there and, and get them involved to explain to their countries or to communicate or to be representative, okay, in a way or another for, for a creating awareness, open dialogue, explaining to them the, 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 the the effect of their rigidness with the religion and the effect on this, the long-term impact of, of uh, underage marriage, uh, of other things. I mean, it's, it's really time, first of all, for the foreign countries or Western countries to take responsibility, itemize and prioritize which of these problems they want to face. And, have an open dialogue with their diaspora and their countries, explaining to them and the diasporas explaining. And this is one way. I'll, I'll tell you the effect of, or the impact of young age marriage. I was 11 years old when I was walking back to my house and in some of, some in the alley actually, there was my schoolmate getting married 11 years. 11 years, marrying somebody who is over 40 as a second wife, because her family were very poor. And for me, for me, I was so happy because it means that I am next. Why not? The prophet married Aisha at six, so I am so old. So we have to explain this in public. We shouldn't hide anything. We, I mean, I, I take it for sure that each one of us is concerned about her country, her new adopted country, as well as back home. We cannot cover, cut ourselves from our roots, emotional roots and care and concern. This is where a lot of people back where, I mean, where I live in London, they think I am crazy. How could I say the bad things about this and that? I'm going to say the bad things because I want the best for both. Because there, I cannot deny that, yes, there is a threat coming from this indoctrinization, whether it is violence. I cannot generalize. Don't get me wrong. The, the, the majority of of Muslims are decent human beings. They want to earn, they live in peace and they don't have this. But unfortunately, these minorities who have been indoctrinated, you know, they, they are the danger on their communities and on mine. I don't want my grandchildren to be subjected to have a, 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 a hunger strike as I have done through many of them you know, to get my education and to go. So we got to unite together to, as organization solidarity to, to bring our voices to wherever we come from, as well as organizations here. I mean, how would it, how would you feel if, 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 it, the, the, the world is full of crazy people or lunatics or whatever. How would I feel if, if one of them come and attack a young child because she is wearing the hijab? And it could happen. How would you feel? I mean, we, we, we really need to really shake our governments to, to what they are doing in the name of humanity and democracy. Democracy 
state that we are equal. So I don't want, I don't want another law in this in any country. I don't want a young girl uh, brainwashed and indoctrinated with, with she's free when she is an adult, when she is a mature adult. When I asked an idiot from the Muslim Brothers who was the head of the head of the European section uh, as a Muslim brother. When I, uh, when I spoke about underage marriage, you know what his reply was? His reply was, was you cannot compare between a, a girl, a, 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 the same age girl growth, body growth in the Middle East because it is hot countries and London or Europe, it's cold countries. I was, I, I, I told him you measure maturity with body growth. You know, I, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. So something must happen. And truly, I thank uh, the Middle East, uh, this uh, conference to give me the opportunity to talk. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Keep my mouth. Thank you very much. We have to wrap up. Um... Is there any final question from the audience or any uh, final uh, comment just to wrap up? Well, I just want to since my uh, initial remarks was that problematizing religion between religion and a hard place and the, uh, uh, there is a delicate balance in a way that's like those of us who live outside of uh, Muslim majority countries. Uh, um, the, uh, have to fight Islamophobia and have to advance women's rights and human rights. Of the religion. I don't to come up with the notion that there is a single Islam and all are open to interpretation and there are different interpretations. The issue here is that for the change times, that they're looking at certain things as contextual, that is the back in seventh century maybe certain things were okay, but not exactly, and revive the egalitarian elements in the uh, call. You're freezing. Uh, That's where we have the problem. There is no room for such interpretation. Basically, that is the the voices, and I have to say that in addition to alternative pro women pro human rights interpretations of Islam, so we have this really monstrous uh, understanding and practice, which makes me makes it harder for me to defend Islam. I do <laughs> that is like the in a certain. Uh, again, the forums is so, but that is a dilemma and problem that we have there. They criticize what is wrong and then look at the prospect and different ways of interpreting the religion. It was really inspiring to listen to all of you and, and how passionate you, you, passionately you talk about your topics. Um, I hope uh, I I hope you enjoyed the conference, and I have to close the session. I'm sorry. Uh, Thank you, Anna, for your moderating. Yeah. Thank you. Have a great day. And thank you, everyone. You too. And nice meeting you, so me and Alam, and I hope and Alam. It was it was really wonderful hearing your thoughts. Hopefully, we'll get to chat uh, in person sometime in 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 the near future. Definitely, so, anytime you are in London or nearby, you are most welcome. We can have a cup of coffee, discuss it. I'm here. 
I'm here. I can send you my my. I don't know how can I send my telephone number. That we can we can you know uh, 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 the same to Zahra. If you are you know by all means, we have to strengthen our voices. Absolutely. Let's keep talking. We'll do and, that. Yeah. Thank absolutely. you. Thank you. Can write down, thank you. you can write down. You can write your. Thank you.